Okay, now we're going to talk during this uh, lesson I've called Lungs 2. We've got three topics. The alveolus. The previous lungs lesson talked about the whole respiratory tree and diaphragm and so forth. Now I want to talk about the functional unit of the lungs, which is the alveolus. Then after that, we're going to talk about surfactant, which is a liquid that lines the inner surface of each alveolus. And without it, an animal really might not be able to survive or not survive very well. And then finally, what's called the mucociliary escalator. Now this is a good name because the muco refers to mucus. Cilia are little hair-like structures on top of cells that beat, and we're going to find out they beat in a net one direction and carry something up the trachea, and hence the escalator term. Okay, so let's just refresh ourselves a little bit with this nice drawing that some artists did someplace. None of these fine drawings are mine. When I do draw something, you see me do it on the screen. And let's look at this. Here's a lung, of course, and then they're looking at a little segment, and then that's what this box represents. Well, alveolus up here is a singular term, meaning one. Alveoli means many, and of course we know that there's probably a million, millions of these in the lungs. But the one thing I wanted to point out, you can always pause this of course, is what's called the conducting zone. Air has to come down to these alveoli, but on the way there's really no oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. So they're a part of the conducting system, and we'll find out a little bit later they have other jobs, but the point is these are where all the work gets done in the lungs, the alveolus. So if something happens with them, we're in trouble. Okay, so the alveolus is the functional unit. This is where oxygen diffuses out of the lumen of the alveolus into the red blood cell. And then carbon dioxide has just the opposite. And when you look at these alveoli, and I'll maybe bring this one back, it's called a tidal system where air comes in it's a dead-end system and then the air has to move back out the same path kind of like a tide on a beach right so it's called a tidal system uh, just as a little point of contrast comparison birds don't have a tidal system okay then here's a nice little drawing I just want to review <coughs> excuse me a little bit um, the thing is, when you talk about the lungs and the lung and the blood supply that comes to the alveolus to get oxygenated, you know then that the pulmonary artery that's left, that has just exited the right ventricle, is deoxygenated. So that's kind of weird, an artery with blue blood. So that's remember that, because blue usually depicts deoxygenated blood. And it is deoxygenated because it needs to come then to an individual alveolus finally. So you, you finally get to a arterial and then a capillary bed. And the blood flows over this sac-like structure. You know, they're three-dimensional, so they're like a round ball, let's say. And then oxygen is going to diffuse into the capillary bed. And then it's oxygenated, so it's red, but it's in the venous system because then it goes back to the left atrium. So very interesting when you're looking at this uh, depictions. Okay, now I'd like to look at some representations made by medical illustrators of the alveolus and talk about some of the fundamentals. So here we've got one alveolus interfacing a capillary. Notice there's a space here. I'm moving it in red, my red laser pointer. This is interstitial space that's full of interstitial fluid. There would be no air in this area. The air is up here in the lumen of the alveolus and all the conducting tubes. But there's not air here, so be aware of that. This is fluid. And so there is some thickness here where diffusion has to occur. And they're right, there's a diffusion of oxygen from the lumen of the alveolus 
across the wall of the alveolus through this interstitial space through the wall of the capillary and then oxygen is picked up by hemoglobin hemoglobin binds oxygen just a little side point here because you know it's kind of nice to talk about abnormal things too do you know that carbon monoxide does the same when people and animals get exposed to it in incorrect places like they're running a motor inside a house or a furnace malfunctions carbon monoxide that's co diffuses across and it binds to hemoglobin better than oxygen and that's why people usually die because it displaces oxygen and there's no place to carry oxygen because it's all full of carbon monoxide so just a warning very dangerous now they didn't say diffusion of carbon dioxide here, but it is. It's going to diffuse not only from cells, but actually out here too. Carbon dioxide isn't really carried by the hemoglobin to much degree. It's out here. It's going to diffuse across into the lumen. Now here's the thing you got to remember. Diffusion is passive. There's no machine making this oxygen diffuse. It's a brainless thing. It's diffusing because there's a higher concentration of oxygen here then over here, then over here. So diffusion is passive and it only takes place over very microscopic distances, just microns. It can't diffuse very far. So this space here, this whole thickness, I should say, where I'm looking at the laser pointer is called the diffusion barrier. And in normal pets and people, it's a certain thickness and everything is fine. <clears throat> the next lesson we'll talk about what happens when it's not fine when this diffusion barrier either gets too big or interfered with so this is a pretty good diagram I think I spent enough time on it you can pause it look at it again I love these artists drawing so <clears throat> excuse me got a sore throat here a little bit now here's one that we've got blood flow incoming and remember, it's deoxygenated, although it's in an arterial, so that's weird, right? It goes around this alveolus and then heads back towards the heart. Okay, so what do we've got here? We've got air in the lumen of the one alveolus. They're showing oxygen, O2, diffusing across. We don't, we're showing it diffuse. We don't have any red blood cells in the vessel right now but that's the right way simultaneously because carbon dioxide is a higher concentration here than in the air that we breathed hopefully it would diffuse that way if for some reason somebody's breathing carbon dioxide and it's higher concentration in here than in here carbon dioxide would diffuse that way think about it because remember diffusion is brainless it's just higher concentration to a lower concentration well, they've got labeled type 1 alveolar cell, and you should know the type 1, squamous means kind of flat, scale-like, type 1 cells make the wall of the alveolus, okay? This happens to be a nucleus, and then it's a very flat cytoplasm, and they fit together. So here's one, I'm outlining one cell on the other side of that wall. Okay, then type 2 is a surfactant secreting cell. And we're going to find out that surfactant is a fluid, very necessary. Okay, let's scoot that one out of the way and do one more fine drawing that somebody has done. Remember, the more you look at these things, the better. <coughs> uh, sorry, throat. Okay, here we've got oxygen poor blood coming in. They've got faint red blood cells here. Uh, there's the type 1 cell that makes the wall. They've got type 2. This is making surfactant. They call it the respiratory membrane, this thickness. Uh, let me just enlarge that a little bit. Oops, I guess I got the wrong thing here. Enlarge it, and you can see that they're saying this respiratory membrane is my way of saying the diffusion barrier. So you should know there's different ways to call this. And then finally, look at this, a macrophage in the lumen 
of the alveolus. A macrophage is a big eater. It's a type of white blood cell. And if anything gets down to this point in the lungs, like specks of bacteria, dust, these guys will eat the particles. Now let's do a little histology. Histology, the study of tissue. The previous views of the alveolus were artist depictions. These are actual lung tissue taken out from animals, stained, and then we see a two-dimensional, basically, representation or the actual tissue. So let me point some things out. The alveolus is always full of air, sometimes more air than others, because when you exhale, they decrease in size, inhale, they enlarge. Every time you probably see an animal uh, tissue that's fixed, it's really in its exhaled state. Okay, there's an arterial, and they're pointing out some blood cells. That's fine, but remember that's not really going to be where the alveolus uh, diffusion barrier is. It's going to be like here, okay? And there's some capillaries, but the point is lung tissue is very non-dense, as you can see there. So great depiction. Here's one more image from somebody that put more labels on, so that's kind of nice. They even found a macrophage in their fixed specimen. Wow, that's pretty good. That doesn't happen very much. So that's very normal to find a few of those in the lumen. Then here's the type two. Remember that makes a surfactant. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is some smooth muscle because then some of these airways and so forth can increase and decrease in size. If you see what's called an interalveolar septum, septum means wall, so it's a wall between alveoli. Here's the type one cell which makes the wall. And then they've got pointed out, which is really nice here, and I'm going to enlarge it a little bit because it is kind of neat. They've got a capillary pointed out. And can you see the red blood cells? Single file almost in this capillary. And I really like that because that does show you capillaries are very small. <clears throat> the inside diameter isn't much bigger then what a cell can come through, a red blood cell and white blood cells too. So they're really like single file and they travel very slowly. And there's time for diffusion of oxygen to go this way, carbon dioxide to go that way. But because it's diffusion, it's passive. And so everything's slow, a little oxygen gets diffused. And so you need a lot of surface area. That's why you need alveolar, uh, the Alveol, alveoli that number in the millions. Okay. Okay, now we're going to talk about surfactant. We've already been introduced to it a little bit early. Er, and let me bring down this uh, slide that somebody made. Now I'll just read a few things here. First of all, you should know there is a thin film of water on the inside and actually on both sides of the alveolar wall, right? This facilitates the diffusion. It has to, you know, go through those walls. So the water creates some surface tension. And surface tension wants to collapse like a balloon structure into a flatter structure, which we're going to see in the next lesson on lungs. So it tends to want to collapse them, and that's bad. So the type 2 cells, now remember, make surfactant, pulmonary surfactant. And this decreases the surface tension, and you could add here, of water. Decreases the surface tension of water. That's the whole function of surfactant. We're going to find out later, too, that premature infants and premature animals that are born lack enough surfactant to really breathe right. Why do they lack surfactant? Because when you're premature, that means you didn't spend your whole gestational period in the uterus. You short, got shorted some. And you should know that the lungs, since they're not at all used in the fetus, are the last organ to mature and get ready to function. I mean, they're the last ones. 
very, they don't really get ready till the very end because they're not needed until a breath is taken. And so premature infants, premature mammals, always are going to have some lack of surfactant. And it just depends on how much is lacking. It's, yeah, crazy. Okay, let's do another diagram here, or I should say like a slide. Somebody made this, and it had a neat point about it. Surfactant is a protein, okay? It tends to not only decrease the surface tension of water, but it binds to any bacteria that might get down to the alveolar lumen, and then it promotes the phagocyte that's in there to eat it. That's what optimization really means. It makes the phagocyte thinks it's sugar-coated and it's going to go after it faster. And then I thought this was neat. I'm not sure if I really knew this, and I'm not sure if I know the data, but surfactant itself directly is antimicrobial. This would be an indirect effect where the macrophage, which is a big eating cell, so it's a phagocyte phagocytitic cell. That's not the right way to pronounce that, but I'm going to keep moving. Anyway, surfactant is antimicrobial. Now, last, our third topic for this lesson, the mucociliary escalator. Beautiful name. I wish I knew who coined it because it's really descriptive. Here's somebody's PowerPoint slide I found. I'm going to enlarge it. And of course, you can pause this whole thing. I'm going to point out a few things and then keep moving. Um, the mucociliary escalator. Let's go down here. This is the trachea, and then there's branches, right? Um, in the wall of the trachea and all the air tubes are these cells, goblet cells, that make mucus. And there's cilia. And you should know that these cilia have a net movement. They move particles and mucus up towards the mouth so out towards the mouth um, here's the mucus cell here's the cilia here's little particles of that mucus they're depicting it in green it can mucus could be different colors the point is this whole apparatus then can be called the mucociliary escalator if you remember earlier i said there's about 22 branches of tubes before you get down to the alveolus. Well, every time it branches, the air bangs against the walls, right? It's not going to have a smooth linear flow. It's going to be forcing material actually against the walls. And then bacteria and so forth get stuck. I think this maybe is a, a bacterium right here depicted. It gets stuck and then slowly gets moved up. If a lot of mucus is made, then we give it the term phlegm okay so phlegm is interesting it's really excess mucus when you can actually be conscious of it you can be so sick you can spit up phlegm and so forth here's a picture of phlegm um, sorry if you're eating stop eating anyway here's somebody that coughed up some phlegm and it had a, a cactus spine here it is right here. Here's the cactus spine, but it had been in this area and it was irritating the airways. And this person was making phlegm and finally coughed it up, which is great. OK, so that's kind of neat. So that's phlegm. Now, I want to make sure this last picture. You don't get mixed up phlegm with something else. So here's a neat little guy here. Um, <laughs> not sure where he's at, but. Um, this is not phlegm. This is coming from the nasal cavities, right? And so most of us would call this snot. So I just want to make sure you don't call this phlegm because phlegm is going to come from the bronchioles and so forth. You might label this, if we had to label it, a, bilater a bilateral river of snot. Thanks a lot.